Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Beth Neeser, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Oil, Gas, and Chemicals Markets. I'm joined by Mike Augenbaugh, who's going to be talking about corrosion and offshore oil and gas applications, including some opportunities to prevent it through proper material selection. Mike is the Target Market Manager for Oil, Gas, Chemicals, and Refining here at Swagelock, and he's been part of the organization for over 20 years. He has a range of roles that he's had within the organization, including business development, customer service, refinery specialist, and more. So um, we'll be hearing from him today, and he'll be sharing his expertise with us. So with that, Mike, I'm going to hand it over to you, and you can go ahead and dive into our agenda for the day. Yeah, thanks, Beth. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I've been with the Swagelock organization for a very long time and in so many different roles. And and some of my experience comes from dealing directly with customers and their applications. And so uh, corrosion is one of those that we see in many different types of industries. And I do want to talk a little bit about that today. So so where are we going to go over today? We're going to talk a little bit about environmental degradation of materials. And so we we want to focus on offshore applications because this is where it's most prevalent. Uh, there's a couple different types of corrosions we want to go over and things to look out for. And then finally, we want to talk about some of the CPT and CCT uh, temperatures as it relates to critical pitting and crevice corrosion. So first off, what is corrosion, right? And and unfortunately, everything really corrodes over time. It's, it's not something to get overly nervous about, uh, but it's really at which the speed at which corrosion occurs and whether the degradation of material results in any downtime or safety issues. So the good news is this, is that we have extensive history of applications and environments that are known for corrosion, and we can provide uh, some best practices in these situations to reduce these effects or prevent corrosion altogether. So some of the common main areas of corrosion, though, will deal with moisture. Uh, oxygen, electrolytes, and these are all things that create electrical reactions um, and temperatures and acids and bases and mechanical stresses and things like that um, can provide some of these reactions that result in corrosion. Um, in particular, outdoor environments and those submerged in saltwater or sea spray conditions can cause issues faster than others. And usually these environments become more corrosive as you increase temperatures. So offshore environments are usually the most problematic. And so you're dealing with two issues, namely you have internal and external corrosion. You know, whereas the downstream and chemical side usually only affects the inside of piping and tubing systems, although not exclusive to those. Um, on the inside of those systems, you will be dealing with high sulfur from crude. And this can be an issue with certain metals or the just the general abrasive nature of the fluid with high velocities. On the outside of the system, you'll have environmental uh, conditions with high moisture or elevated temperatures and chloride formation, which can rapidly corrode these fluid systems. This is such a common problem, right, that these metallurgies in the systems will usually be high exotic alloys such as 6 moly, 625, uh, duplex, hastaloy, or other types of alloys that can resist crevice and, and pitting corrosion better than standard stainless steel. So corrosion is really a natural process that results in gradual destruction of materials, uh, usually metals, through chemical or electromechanical reactions within their environment. And there are several types of corrosion, each with unique characteristics and causes. Uh, general or uniform corrosion is the most common type, whereas the entire exposed surface of the metal deteriorates uniformly. And this type is very predictable and it's often preventable. Uh, localized corrosion, on the other hand, targets specific areas of the metal and includes pitting, crevice, and filiform corrosion. Another significant type of corrosion, or sorry, galvanic corrosion, which occurs when two metals are in electrical contact in a corrosive electrolyte. So this causes one metal to corrode faster than it would alone. And then environmental cracking is a corrosion process influenced by environmental conditions such as chemical exposure, temperature and stress. This category in, includes stress corrosion cracking and intergranular corrosion. Erosion corrosion combines mechanical wear and chemical attack often seen in high velocity fluid systems. So really understanding these types of corrosion and their mechanical or their mechanisms is crucial for implementing effective prevention and mitigation strategies. 
Pitting corrosion, sorry, pitting and crevice corrosion are very easy to identify as they behave completely differently from one another. Uh, pitting corrosion is typically uniform across the surface of the metal and forms usually under seawater environments, especially when seawater evaporates and concentration of chloride deposits increase. You will usually see small indentation or pits everywhere and the surface of the metal usually resembles the appearance of rust. Crevice corrosion, on the other hand, is much more difficult to find as the name implies. You'll have local corrosion or degradation of the material under things such as clamps, gaskets, or hidden under a drip point. Uh, crevice corrosion is, is the result of stagnant fluids that find their ways into trapped areas and can appear quite large, even creating structural issues if not identified in time. In offshore environments, if speaking strictly about potential damages and extent of material replacement, its pitting corrosion is more common than crevice corrosion as it can affect large areas of the exposed tubing pipes and components. Because pitting is not localized to specific areas, external protection of these systems is usually the focus, whereas pitting corrosion will be dealt with by system layout and protection in common failure zones. So pitting corrosion is, is when a thin layer of chromium oxide that protects 316 stainless steel uh, this is called the passive oxide layer. And pitting corrosion starts with the breakdown of the passive oxide layer that protects the metal from corrosion. The formation of shallow pits occurs in very specific locations, right where the passive oxide layer has broken down. The shallow pits can grow deeper over time. They can grow very deep until the tubing is perforated, so it forms really a hole. And in a pit, iron from the steel is slowly being oxidized. The, the, the ferric ion diffuses out of the pit and forms deposits of iron oxide or rust. Just like pitting corrosion, creve crevice corrosion also starts with the breakdown of the passive oxide layer that protects a me metal from corrosion. The formation of shallow pits occurs within a tight crevice, for example, a crevice between tubing and a plastic tubing clamp, and the shallow pits can grow large over time and cover the whole crevice. In some areas, pits can grow very deep until the tubing is perforated. In a crevice, the iron ion dissolves into a liquid that is pre present in the crevice. Because the crevice is so tight, the iron ions cannot readily diffuse out of the crevice. Therefore, the concentration of the iron ions in the crevice increases. In salt water, negatively charged chloride ions are attracted by the positively charged iron ions, and therefore the chloride ions begin to diffuse into the crevice. Crevice corrosion is dangerous because it often occurs at a much lower temperature than pitting corrosion. So one of the best ways to prevent corrosion is metallurgy. So you always wanna look at the best possible alloy to prevent future maintenance issues, but within the budget you are working within. And there's some great solutions that can minimize the impacts of corrosion. One of my favorite solutions is jacketed tubing and pipe. This is a plastic cover over top traditional stainless steel tubing. The plastic is resistant to seawater environments as well as galvanic issues that can prevent corrosion from occurring in the first place. I will give you a disclaimer though, you really need to seal off the materials from the external environments uh, and jacketed tubing can discover these issues if you don't seal off this with jacketed tubing connectors um, as well. Overall, stainless steel is one of the better alloys to handle corrosion, but it's really all about time and aggressiveness. And in some cases, you know, traditional copper tubing can handle corrosion better than stainless steel, but in others, stainless steel is better suited. Um, you know, however, I always like to discuss metallurgy with customers prior to simply just defaulting to stainless steel in all applications. Some offshore and onshore applications will use 6 Moly and 2507 more than stainless, but then we'll use stainless in utility gases and liquids. As an example, stainless steel is great for steam, but if you have leaks under your insulation known as CUI or corrosion under insulation and are also creating a hot and humid environment, stainless steel can exhibit premature failure zones and stress corrosion cracking. The good news is that your facility most likely has a metallurgist or a corrosion engineer that can help you if you're experiencing any of these issues. Another way to present, prevent corrosion is by looking closely at installation practices. 
Tubing or pipe making contact with another alloy can create an anode and cathode situation, which is referred to as galvanic corrosion. It's often misunderstood that this only occurs underwater. In reality, the atmospheric side of a platform can also be a perfect environment for galvanic corrosion due to the high humidity and sea spray environments. If you see zones of your system being localized, it may not be pitting or crevice corrosion and could be a galvanic. And this can be solved with better system layout. The next opportunity is to investigate the tubing primarily. Tubing will not have the same granular mass and thickness as machine fittings and valves and is more susceptible to corrosion. And so one of the things you can do is use standard lower cost standard stainless steel fittings, but swap out with exotic alloy tubing. We call these engineered combinations and reduces the overall system volume on the exposed tubing to be a higher grade alloy that's able to handle this environment. If your project is cost conscious, this is a great way to stay within standard stainless steel fittings and valves, but mix in exotic alloy tubing. Your local swage lock sales and service location can provide literature discussing how this practice can reduce overall installation costs. The one thing you should take away from our discussion is that increased temperatures will almost always put corrosion rates into hyperdrive. Some systems will be perfectly fine in ambient temperature environments, but as soon as you increase the temperature, the system will exhibit corrosion. Critical pitting temperatures and critical crevice temperatures, known as CPT and CCT, are measured by exposing a particular alloy to the application it will be exposed to, and then simulating the effects of increasing temperatures. The point at which the corrosion begins on the metal surface is known as CPT or CCT. CPT and CCT will have different temperature thresholds. So as an example, in a 10% ferric chloride control, 316L tubing will show a negative 14 degrees CCT, where CPT will be 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This trend of critical crevice corrosion being lower than critical pitting temperature follows pretty much every alloy out there. So this is where enlisting the help of your site metallurgists, or in some cases vendors, can support your project and get you into the right alloy, which balance the cost and effectiveness. So in summary, corrosion is inevitable. Your best course of action is to empower your operators to identify and document corrosion areas in your system. Early warnings to planners and engineers are key towards preventing the larger system issues. For example, your operator may be walking past the same panel or enclosure every day and notice that corrosion is getting worse. And this is really the time to document and schedule replacement, or at the very least, an investigation. Also, enlist the help of your facility corrosion en engineer or metallurgist to train operators on identification and system integrity. You can also reach out to firms that specialize in these applications, as well as vendors who can help make this decision as well as some of the products that may be available to prevent these issues from occurring in the first place. Many times, these vendors have services that can help document and provide valuable recommendations for system improvements. Great, thank you, Mike. And as it says here on the slide, we have some more information available on swagelock.com on this topic, and you can also contact your local authorized swagelock sales and service center to learn more. Thank you all.